Okay, so here's a video on externalities. I'm gonna talk you through the same externality that I did in the notes, but a little bit slower. So this will be a positive externality on supply. We'll talk about how you graph it, how you show the socially optimal price and quantity versus the quantity given by the market and the price given by the market, and then the cherry on top, how you use letters to arrive at an estimation of deadweight loss. Then, after that, we'll do a separate graph to talk about resolving um, this positive supply externality with a Pigovian tax or subsidy. In this case, because we want more of the good, we'll be using a subsidy. And that should get you um, refreshed on all of the tricky graph parts of an externality problem. Okay, so here we have a positive externality on supply. That would be a good such as uh, the chocolate factory we talked about in class that creates this great smell. It could also be a beehive, somebody who's keeping bees. Um, bees do lots of great things for the ecosystem. They pollinate plants all around, lowering costs for other people. It could be a power plant in Florida that's heating up manatees. Um, it's not one that we typically think a ton about um, because we tend to stereotype firms, the suppliers, as being these big, dirty producers, but they do have a lot of positive externalities. Um, research can have positive externalities for other people as technology spillovers occur, um, the supply of education, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go back to our B example. Let's think about a beekeeper who is keeping bees. This is the market for bees. There is some private supply of bees that's given by the private marginal cost. That would be things like the cost to the beekeeper of building the beehives, and you don't really have to feed bees. Um, let's say the beekeeping outfit, that cool hood and netting, um, the smoke that they use to subdue the bees when they need to harvest the honey. Those are born by the person supplying the bees. They are accounted for in the market. Then there is a market or private supply or demand for bees, which is given by the marginal benefits to private individuals. So whoever's buying the bees in this market will have a demand curve that comes from their private marginal benefit, probably related to the amount of honey the bees produce, what they think they can sell the bees for in the future. And together, the market supply and demand determine the market price and the market quantity. But we believe that bees have a positive external benefit to people not involved in the supply of beekeeping. So that means that this marginal cost needs to be lowered by the amount of the external benefit. And that will give us the marginal cost to society. It's going to be lower than the marginal cost to the private individual because of this positive external benefit. So that will be reflected in the social supply. So at every quantity, the dollar amount will be vertically lower. Another way of thinking about that is that every price of bees, society would prefer a higher quantity to reflect the positive supply externality. That means that what society wants is more bees at lower prices. And that is simply to incentivize people to supply that higher quantity of bees. Or sorry, to purchase that higher quantity of bees. So now, the letters. I don't know why my market price is so wonky. Just to reiterate before we do that, we would predict that the market will provide less bees than is socially optimal and the market price for bees will be too high relative to what society would like. And so now we need to use letters to reflect the changes in consumer, producer surplus, and deadweight loss that are brought about by this externality. 
I'm going to put a letter on everything in the big blue triangle of market consumer and producer surplus. And also these letters right here because these are going to become important. D, it turns out, is going to always move to, well, actually it won't always move together. So we'll do one there, one here, one here, and one here. Okay, I'm going to just erase this so that I have room to do my letters on the same tiny whiteboard. But this was the private supply, and the socially optimal supply. Also, one thing that we did not show is that the per unit amount of the externality is that vertical distance between the social supply curve and the private supply curve. So, what the market will do on the left and what the social outcome will provide on the right. At that market price, the blue price, consumers are benefiting A. This is all the people that would pay much more for Bs than they have to pay in the market. That market price, producers are benefiting by B and C. This is all the beekeepers that would supply bees down here but get to charge up here, and their benefits are there. And then there's a positive externality. It's not going to be negative because the bees at the market quantity are contributing to the social well-being. The amount of the externality is always going to be the per unit amount multiplied by the quantity at the market. So the market quantity is here in blue. The per unit amount is this vertical distance between the curves. It's the amount of the externality is this little parallelogram right there, DE. So the total that we get in the market is A, B, C, D, and E. At the social outcome, at this quantity and this price, consumers are accepting a much lower price. That means their benefits have gone up. They get A, B, D, and F. Remember the social outcome is where we've done something to recognize the external benefit created by these Bs. We've lowered the price for consumers and expanded the market. Internalize the externality. Producers now have this lower cost, that's the actual cost of the Bs to society, and their price is up here, so they are getting C, E, and G. And the externality is zero. At the social outcome, the externality is always zero. We say that we've internalized it. So the total is going to be all the letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Deadweight loss is always the difference between the two columns. So deadweight loss will be this total minus that total. It's the two letters that are present here and are not present over there. It's F and G. This is the deadweight loss from getting two little Bs. Another way of thinking about this is these are all the Bs that would be provided at the social outcome where the benefit on the demand curve is less than the true cost to society down here. So for all of these units, the benefits exceed the true cost, and we're foregoing these potential mutually beneficial transactions by not accounting for the actual low cost of beads because of all their spillovers for the rest of the ecosystem. Okay, so that is how to use letters to arrive at our estimate of the inefficiency created by this externality. Again, at the social outcome, consumers are better off, producers are better off, and society as a whole is better off because total surplus is higher. So the market is forcing this inefficiency of FG by not producing more bees, even though the benefits of those bees would exceed their true cost. So one way this might get corrected is with a Pigovian subsidy. So 
So I'm just going to redraw our graph because in order to do a Pigovian subsidy, we don't actually need all of those beautiful letters. So we have the private supply, the private demand, then the socially optimal supply, and the socially optimal equilibrium compared to the market equilibrium. So society wants more bees. One way to get there is by paying producers. Right? The subsidy could either be to producers or to the consumers of bees. And we're going to show using our graph that it doesn't matter. It's Pigovian always if the amount of the subsidy is equal to the amount of the externality in per unit terms. So we want a subsidy that's exactly equal to that vertical distance, this is going to be our subsidy supply. That new subsidy supply will result in the higher quantity we want, exactly equal to the social price. Buyers will pay lower prices. Sellers will receive higher prices. And the subsidy creates this deadweight loss. But we just showed that the externality itself was creating this deadweight loss. So after the subsidy, society is actually neutral. There's no extra deadweight loss created. They've corrected and eliminated this externality deadweight loss, but created a little bit of subsidy deadweight loss. It does not matter whether they pay this to suppliers and shift supply out, or if they pay it to consumers and shift demand out. This is what a subsidy to consumers, a Pigovian subsidy, exactly equal to the per unit amount of the externality, would increase the quantity to this amount, decrease the price of buyers down here, increase the price of sellers up there, and cause that same triangle of deadweight loss. All of the impact would be exactly the same, regardless of which curve initially shifted. And that is a Pigovian subsidy.